Well, we're excited to be here today, and we know we have a, a fairly large group on the phone, so um, we will walk you all through some of the key nuggets that we have around the turnover scorecard, and um, hopefully get some questions at the end. So definitely be sending those questions in, and we're excited to talk to several of you folks here today. Um, let's look over the agenda, Christina. And, and Christina and I will take a very um, interactive approach because we want to make this interesting for you and hopefully um, teach you some of the things that we've learned throughout the years of doing consulting. Absolutely. Yeah, so today what we'll look at is really what is the impact of turnover and, you know, what does that really cost the organization and why is it so important to control? And what you'll find is, you know, in a little bit that that's all over the place. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the psychology of turnover. So what causes people to leave and is it something that can be prevented and where do you actually have control over that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, some people have the conception that all turnover is bad and that's really not the case, Carol. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to show you our methodology around the turnover scorecard and how you would utilize both qualitative and quantitative information to really target certain interventions to reduce the turnover. Absolutely. And then, Carol, you'll be leading us through some discussion of different analytics that individuals can, can take to look at their turnover and really understand what's going on there. And the different findings may lead them down the road to different kinds of interventions. Absolutely. Yep. So super excited to speak to you all about this. Um, as we talk through it, though, it's important to really get grounded in terms of what turnover means and how it impacts you. Now, we're going to ask a poll here in a minute around what the cost of turnover is for you for certain roles. Um, but just to kind of give you uh, a, a stat here around what, what Sherm says is that the cost of turnover can be, um, you know, six to nine months of someone's salary to be able to find and replace somebody. So for a 60K employee, that's about $45,000 to replace. The other thing is, you know, many of the cost of turnover is really being calculated more as direct costs. So what does it cost to actually attain that person? You know, what is the recruitment cost? What is the training cost? And not so much um, it are certain things like productivity costs or even the impact to the culture or your customers. And those are more of the indirect cost of turnover. All right, so let's do a poll. Um, and as you see these questions, I'm going to read the poll to you. It, what we want to look at here is for jobs that you have high volume. So in your organization, try to find or imagine one job that's high volume where you do have a lot of turnover. Estimate what you believe the cost of losing one person is. So what is your cost of turnover per person? Um, is it A, zero to 3,000? Is it B, um, a little over 3,000 to 6,000. Is it C, 6,000 to 10,000? Um, D, 10,001 to 20,000? E, 20,001 20, to 40,000? Or F, you don't know. And remember for this one, you'll just pick one choice based on um, your, your closest estimation. Yep. Super. So Holly, can we start seeing some of those results populate? Great. So, Carol, it's really interesting. I mean, we're seeing that a significant portion of our um, attendees, you know, may not quite know exactly what their turnover is as they think about these critical roles. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's where there's a lot of information out there on the Internet and a lot of great resources. Um, and we'll spend some time today talking about how we calculate it and how you might even understand when a certain hire is actually going to return the investment of what it costs to actually hire them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the turnover cost calculation, though, Carol, I mean, what's the benefit to putting a number on this? Well, I think it's super important because one of, um, you know, one of my clients was able to reduce turnover from, I believe it was like 30% to 17% for their managers. Mm -hmm. And so because she had an estimated ROI savings, she was able to get budget to do other things in the business um, that helped support more retention of employees, like to, to agree sure. to pay for a college, you know, college for some of their employees and things like that. So it's, it's very useful to be able to, mm -hmm. to calculate it. And really translates it into the business, to the, to the business needs, right, the, the underlying financials. Yep, absolutely. Okay. 
All right, Holly, we can um, go back, but I guess just to summarize this, almost, you know, it, it's a lot of people, about 50% don't really know um, what their cost of a, a bad hire is. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, if you think about an hourly job, um, you know, they may range anywhere from like fifteen to thirty thousand, you know, a year. And you're looking at ma the majority of people here for their high volume jobs. They're finding that it's going to cost them between ten to even forty thousand. So, interesting findings here with with the folks on the call. Absolutely. All right. So if we can go back to the presentation. Awesome. Yep. So. With that, you know, now you're kind of thinking about your overall cost. You know, we want to dig in and think about what are those drivers that are impacting your turnover. So we like to think about them in terms of these two kind of components, these driving forces, the push factors and the pull factors. And those push factors are just what you might imagine. There's those things that really detract or push someone away from working at your organization. Whereas the pull are those that attract individuals, make them want to be there, make them feel connected and, and really tied into the culture. And from a push perspective, individuals start kind of experiencing these factors very early on in the relationship with the organization. So even before they're hired, so as candidates. So if you think about them coming across a, a careers website, Carol, I mean, that's where they start to gain information that gives them an indication of if it's a place they want to work. Mm -hmm. And it may, in fact, push a bad candidate away. Yeah, and I think that's what we're seeing a lot nowadays around employee, employee branding is to make sure you're really putting out there what's the type of employee you want to attract, who's going to be successful at your organization. Mm -hmm. it, and these, these factors definitely do promote fit, mm -hmm. right? So from a pull perspective, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that those pull factors may shift for an individual over the course of their employment life cycle. So the things that attract them to the, or, to, to the organization early on as a candidate may not really be the things that keep them attached or connected as their career progresses. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I would think that, you know, if you have some really strong pull factors, like really great culture that your organization might have, getting somebody really integrated quickly so that you hook them is, is critical. Yeah, absolutely. And having those strong pull factors can actually outweigh some of those push factors. I mean, we all know that our various roles have some of them, right? There are certain aspects to them that we they just are or are not desirable. Um, and so they can actually outweigh one another depending on their strengths. So let's take a deeper dive on that. So when we look at those push factors, so let's, let's, let's dig in there. So from a push perspective, if we look at three buckets, so first of all, talent management processes, local workforce factors, and really external factors, there's a lot going on that could influence someone um, to be kind of detracted or pushed away from a particular organization. In this example on this slide, you can see that the ones in red are ones that may be difficult for you as a professional in the HR function to control. You know, depending on your position in the business, some of these things are, are really out of our control. So, for example, um, some of the benefits and compensation, how they compare in, in the industry and across jobs. You know, there may be aspects to that you can control, but, but there may be points at which it's simply a maximum for your organization. So, so I guess if you can't control it, then what do, do, can we, do we just not do anything about it? Well, you, you can see the title of the slide, right? So there, there's absolutely ways you can do things, right? So the key here is about setting accurate expectations. And what we see very often when we look at new higher turnover is that it's because you see a deviation between what happened and was communicated during the recruitment and selection process and then what the individual personally experiences the job as post-hire. So creating continuity between those two experiences is really critical. That makes sense. All right, so let's take a look at the opposite factor. So let's look at that pull factor. Um, when you think about these same buckets, you'll find some very actionable items. And so let's, let's look at a couple. So for example, that there are available career paths that there's development programs, 
that an individual might, for example, see that the organization has a commitment to the uh, community that it's in, that there's a sense of social responsibility. Um, and also that the employment brand resonates with that individual's values and the things that they care about. Now, we talked about it before, Carol, I think you, you brought this up, that it's important to get individuals engaged with these pull factors early on. Sometimes we wait until further and further in their relationship with the organization before we bring up things like development and culture, but we might wait until it's too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're going to talk about it here. I'm not, not going to steal your thunder, but on the next slide, you know, what really is a huge pull factor and really hooks people is if they believe in, like, what the organization is doing, not just to sell a product to make money, but sometimes it's more of the greater good. Like, yes. what is this company doing? What am I a part of? What am I having impact on? Exactly. Exactly. You're absolutely right. So let's go there. So, you know, when we think about these push and pull factors, another way to conceptualize them is kind of going back to basics. So let's take Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I know most of you are familiar with this. In fact, you may have seen a, a similar graphic, but when we think about the most basic needs an individual has, that's really around that survival component. And so let's look at the relationship of these needs to what the organization is providing through that job relationship. So from a survival perspective, we're looking at can the individual um, pay for their meals? Can they, are they safe at the job? Are there aspects that are allowing this individual to, um, to carry on their daily life? Once those are met, you kind of can move up to things like security. Are they getting paid enough um, to feel secure? Are there, is there a bold sense of belonging? Are they tied into the social fabric of the organization? Do they feel like they're a part of something? And then, as you mentioned, Carol, the importance. Are they, are they feeling like they're making a contribution that matters? And finally, at the top, you know, is this something that, that really engages their sense of purpose and commitment? Now, if we think about that in connection with the push and pull factors, let's take, for example, the idea that an organization has, as we were talking about, a social responsibility program where they're engaged in the uh, community, they're doing great things, this is resonating with values. You know, a social responsibility program, for example, it might outweigh a push factor that's pretty minor, but it might not outweigh a push factor that's significant. And so you have to look at the relationship if you think about those on a scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there could be some things, like what's a little bit scary, and and I'll kind of steal my own thunder here in terms of the next (laughs) slide, is, you know, you may have some people that kind of are operating in those lower levels of Maslow's needs where, you know, yeah, maybe they're, you know, they're able to, like, deal with the fact that they're not paid well or, but they have, like, zero commitment or belonging Mm -hmm. or other kind of factors on this higher level, but they don't leave, right? And so that can have just as much of a detrimental um, effect. So as you mentioned before, you know, so not all turnover is necessarily bad. It, is, it isn't necessarily bad, and that's where you really need to kind of take a deeper dive. Um, you know, what, what we found is that 28% of retained employees um, have lower engagement um, than the people who are turning over. And what I, what I find is really difficult is that can shift your entire culture. If you've got people that are just kind of operating in the, let me just do what I can to get by, I mean, they tend to take, like, more vacations. They tend to do less of their share of the work. And so they end up mm-hmm. putting more strain on, on the rest of the team. You're, you're absolutely right, Carol. I mean, all the studies seem to show that higher employee engagement in high-trust organizations, you, you get these positive factors of, of higher discretionary effort, um, more, um, fewer sick days, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, in some of our research, some of the things that we found is um, some opposite things that you would see. So, you know, we do pre-employment assessments for our, a lot of our companies, and one of the, the findings that we found in, in one uh, situation is that we found that people who had, like, a higher stress tolerance tended to leave more, and it's because they're comfortable mm-hmm. with, like, shifting jobs and changing. So even though that's really good for the job as well, if you've got these other, like, push factors that are kind of hitting on them, they're more likely to jump because they can handle the stress. They can change jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they may be more resistant to the, to the chaos that, that, frankly, changing jobs causes. Yeah, exactly. Great. So 
As we're thinking about these push and pull factors, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, how on earth do I go about figuring these things out? Um, and we had the same, the same thought. So with some of our clients, what we've done is implemented um, kind of a, a proprietary methodology where we've looked at um, how can we identify and uncover what those push and pull factors are. And, and you can take a similar approach. First, though, I think what's important about this, Carol, is that it has this complementary component. So we begin by understanding from a diagnostic perspective, right? We kind of put our doctor's hat on, so you can see the little stethoscope there. What, what is happening, right? What, what is going on within the organization across some different identified um, kind of areas of focus that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, where we gather some different types of data and try to understand it from a qualitative perspective in addition to an analytics perspective. So we pair both our kind of deep dive on the client's data and what's happening, and you'll give us a preview of this in a minute, but also we look at it from what are we hearing from the organization? What are people telling us? Interesting. That's a, that's a nice blend because I think, you know, sometimes just looking at the data alone doesn't paint the right picture, right? Yeah. Well, and what we find is that when we hear when we hear those nuggets from individuals at different levels of the organization, and that's an important component of it, um, that really what we're hearing is direction, mm -hmm. and it guides us sometimes on what we want to look at with the analytics. Yep. Great. So it's time for another poll. Okay. All right. So now we want you to go ahead and select as many um, that apply to you. So we're interested in understanding what types of diagnostic tools you have actually put in place um, in your organization to try to understand turnover. So the A is, you know, you've put in place some kind of survey that you give to a new hire to get feedback on the hiring process or the onboarding process. Um, B is an engagement survey that, and, you know, don't just click that one if you have an engagement survey, but don't use it for turnover. So think about what you actually use for understanding turnover. So that would be another one. C is exit interviews or surveys with people who have left the organization. Um, D would be stay interviews. These are interviews with people who have stayed there, kind of have um, gone past, you know, where people typically turn over and understand what keeps them there. Um, e is looking at analytics, so really taking a look at what is the percentage of people and when they're turning over and why they're turning over. Or F, you don't really have anything in place right now that helps you understand turnover trends. So, Holly, can you... Can you show us what people are selecting? I love how this just populates. I know. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. So, I mean, we're really seeing representation across the board, which is fantastic. And that tells us that, you know, you, you do have some great mechanisms in place today. Yeah, that is great. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting how the state interviews are smaller. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably one of the easier surveys to actually get information on. But they're really new, Carol, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the focus on the state interview, it's flipping things on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, the traditional exit interview you can see here is it's kind of leading the charge. Yep, yep. And I would think, you know, as what we've seen is that the exit interview, you generally have a smaller sample size, right? So you're only capturing probably, it's kind of like customer surveys, surveys. you're capturing those that are really upset, right? But it probably does give you some good, honest data, too. Absolutely. I mean, I think your best bet is to have a, a good mixture so that you're taking really that multi-method approach. Yep. Great. All right, Holly, do you want to um, take us back to the presentation? Awesome. Super. And so you can just see the representation here is, is an indicator of, you know, this is the more of the multi-method approach that we use when we're evaluating turnover um, drivers within an organization. So we have that diagnostic component where we do actual interviews with key stakeholders for the role. So, you know, we can look at turnover organizationally, but I think we get really point, poignant results when we're more targeted. So if we look at those critical roles that are um, experiencing the most detrimental effect of turnover, then we can be much more um, intentional and specific in recommendations and interventions. 
So interviewing key stakeholders, and that might be individuals that are design, have a design element in the role. They're determining what the role is and what the key responsibilities are and what it looks like day in and day out. The state interviews, as well as engagement survey data. We also conduct recent hire and recent, recently separated surveys to the extent that we can, right? Um, and then finally, we really do evaluate what are those processes and documents that we can kind of get our hands on and review and, and learn how those are impacting those push-pull factors. Super. So I mentioned before that when, we're, when we are doing this diagnostic um, and the analytic component, we're bringing it together towards the turnover scorecard, we want to understand what are those different components or buckets that might influence this. And so some of those are going to be at different levels. Some will be kind of industry-wide, some might be at the organization level, and some might be at the level of the role. So things like market factors. Um, what's happening in the recruitment hiring process for that individual that's hired? What happens from an onboarding and training perspective? Yeah, and I think this is where, you know, you can really see some of the push and the pull factors, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that you might find under the culture and the environment are those really kind of awesome pull factors that you might have from an organization. Whereas some of the things under the role scope and if somebody's satisfied might be some of the, you know, the push factors. However, you know, we do know that some people are motivated by challenging work and actual tasks. Yes. So those those pull factors also kind of reside in every single one of these. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Carol. Absolutely. Well, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive, and, and we'll pick the culture and environment one. Um, you know, what, what this does, when we do look at this scorecard and we're kind of taking a deep dive into each one of these, we'll ask specific questions about what's going on in the organization around this. Mm -hmm. And we try to find measurable things to really give us a good indicator as to, you know, not only what do they have in place, but how effective are they. So, you know, one of the things that you see in almost every organization is generally a vision or a, a purpose statement, and they're all over plastered around the walls, right? But how much of that is actually being lived by in terms of the company? You know, what's the communication of the leaders to the entire organization? You know, is there some discrepancy there? Um, what is the social – do they do anything from a social responsibility standpoint? Do they do events that really bring the team together? Together and um, you know, help them have a greater purpose because we know that that tends to be a really yeah. good pull factor. And does the leadership team participate? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, recognition programs, and then I always like to look at you know, have they won any awards? Mm -hmm. Have they even put themselves out there to win awards? Because many of those um, factors, you know, you have to survey employees to understand if um, you know their leaders. Walk the talk. Yeah. Talk the walk, walk the talk. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> One of those things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, you know, with those different scorecards, um, as we saw with the factors before, mm -hmm. right, there were so many different buckets that we go deep diving into. Yeah. Right? I mean, we, we, have, we have a variety of buckets. And, and, and the tactic is really that when we are gathering that data from the individuals in the role, that's going to guide us kind of where to, where to dig in here, Carol. Um, but it, from a push-pull kind of understanding perspective, it could be in a variety of areas. Yep, definitely. So let's take a, a poll and, and let's look at, because um, that's more that qualitative side, right? It is. Yeah. So now let's talk about the quantitative side. So how do you actually look at analytics and make decisions about where turnover is happening and why? And so as you all are evaluating um, turnover data, um, let us know on this poll, you know, what is the type of turnover data that you do analyze? Um, are you primarily, and you can pick as many as you want here, are you primarily picking, you know, what's the count in terms of termination, so getting kind of more of a count? Are you looking deeper? Like, and don't choose reason if if you collect it, but don't look at it, right? Because I think um, a lot of organizations collect it, but they don't necessarily um, – you know, have, like, a lot of faith in that data. So sometimes it's collected as voluntary and involuntary. So if you do it that way and you use it, click that one uh, or pick B. If you use it 
more specific. So you really have gotten disciplined around the specifics, like is it about pay? Is it about their supervisor? Is it because they got another job offer? Like more of those reasons, then pick C. Um, do you also look at demographics? Like do you look and see if there are certain people of a certain age or a certain um, ethnicity group that tend to be turning over at a higher rate? Um, the next one here I think is super interesting, internal versus external. So what we mean by that is, you know, did this person actually promote into this role or was it somebody that was an external hire? So do you pay attention to that to see if, if there's different trends there? Um, also location, and location can be brand or concept if you have multiple uh, concepts within your business. Um, and then just put other for G and then H if you don't really analyze turnover with data at this level. Great. So, Holly, can you show us the results of the poll? So it's looking like the majority of people are, are really focused on that termination count and more of a categorical reason, so voluntary, involuntary, most likely. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, as we begin to consolidate like our HRIS systems and a lot of different data systems that we have today, I mean, I know, you know, at the beginning of technology, which is not that long <laughs> ago, actually, you know, there were so many different niche players that had either an HRIS system, an applicant tracking system, you had all these different siloed systems, we're starting to see that come together a little bit more, which will really help in terms of, you know, understanding this data mm -hmm. and being able to utilize it better. Well, and it helps you paint a stronger picture because each of them are more integrated, allowing for a unified um, kind of understanding of turnover. Yeah, absolutely. So, Carol, just real quick before we leave this, are, do you have any recommendations around what you'd encourage people to to think about as they're collecting turnover? Yeah. Um, because yeah. the data piece is important, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that, you know, really focusing in, my preference is to focus in on that new hire turnover, not necessarily all turnover as a whole, because we do know if somebody's been there 20 years and they turn over, it's not necessarily a bad turnover. They, they were there 20 years. You know, that was a good contribution to the business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that new hire turnover, I think focusing in on that is really critical. And if there's other factors that you collect as we start to get these systems to speak to each other, you know, things like when was the person's last raise? What is their salary? compared to market. You know, there's so many other elements um, that can be factored in. And at a certain point, you know, we can start using machine learning to be able to say, are there retention risks with certain people so we can predict them leaving before they happen? Um, and I think that that, you know, like having that new survey, uh, new... The new hire survey. Yeah, uh -huh. That is like critical, um, especially if it's not overly confidential where you can actually identify the person mm -hmm. and be able to do some kind of an intervention um, because they are giving feedback early on that they're struggling with something. And so that's a, that's a great point to come back and actually try to help that individual. Yeah. And, and the ideal is that you have a proactive strategy around this so you can, early, you can have early identification. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Holly, if you can take us back to the presentation. So when, when we do look at analytics, you know, we try to, um, one, get data that most companies um, actually have access to. And, and we find that turnover data generally from HR is easier to collect than things like performance data. Um, sometimes performance data is, is more of a mystery. It's, you know, in, in a different system. But, you know, turnover is pretty black and white. Like, where they, when do they leave? How long, how many days do they stay? But being able to capture some of the other things like reason um, allows you to, to do a deeper dive and really understand, you know, are certain people leaving maybe at different times for a different reason. So when we analyze the data, we take two approaches. We kind of look at um, when turnover is happening, right? So when are people turn over, turn, turning over? And also, you know, what is that 30, 60, or 90-day turnover? So what's that number? Um, who are those people that are turning over? And if we look at just a few of those variables that I showed on the poll, things like um, the demographic variables, right? So in that same company that I was talking about with um, the stress tolerance and people, you know, that are really high on that actually jumping ship quicker, um, we also found that people that were older would stay longer. 
Um, and so that was an interesting uh, component in that study as well. Um, looking at location and region, I'll show you some examples of this, but you know, is there something about a particular area that is having much higher turnover than another area? Is it associated with the leader in that group or is it associated with the market trends in that area? So those are all important things to try to understand. And also if you've got a superstar, like how do you get that um, best, the best practices that they're doing shared to the other locations? Um, internal versus external hires. Again, this one's really interesting because, you know, a lot of organizations will say, you know, we, we only hire externals. We want to have new blood. We want to be able to, like, really get kind of different thoughts within this one department. And you end up seeing that your external uh, turnover is much higher sometimes. And a lot of it could be that that organization is just not ready for that change mm -hmm. or people in the organization are not adopting that person as well. So, well, And if you think about the internal, they already are bought into those pull factors. Yeah, true. Right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. You knew those would come back, right? I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, let's keep going. Um, the, the reason we look at time, right, and when, when it happens um, is really useful because, again, there's different things that are happening from the push and the pull throughout the life cycle of that, of that employee. You know, so we know early on, because generally early, you know, new hire turnover within 30, 60 days is generally where we see the highest level of turnover. And I think it is because the pull factor hasn't played in or maybe there's something that happened in terms of the, you know, what they were told about the job and what they actually experienced. Um, you know, so early on, if you see it, it's generally going to be something around the hiring process, the onboarding process. It can also be that the person is just not a good job fit. They don't mm -hmm. have the skill set um, or innately they're just not really good or would they wouldn't necessarily like doing that role. Um, so you generally see that early on. Um, once you get past a certain point, and, and that point is different for every organization. So, you know, some companies have a very short training and onboarding period, which might be just a week or two, and others might have a 12-week period. And so depending on where your training happens, you know, you don't start seeing the other factors play in until after that person's been on the floor, they get experience. We generally see, like, poor performance come into play after that training phase, right? They don't necessarily leave during the training. They wait till they're on the job, and then they, they end up not being able to perform. So um, management and leadership, so a lot of – people leave their organizations because they, you know, don't have a great relationship with their boss. Um, that generally goes from after they get on the floor all the way through the tenure of, of when they're there. After they've been on the floor, they've got pretty good at their current job, then you start to see some more reasons around, um, you know, development, growth, career pathing. I really don't see a future here. I don't see how I can grow. And so they start to think about other organizations that might offer that. And then culture kind of underlying, right? We we don't feel people get, um, you know, I guess culture could be a little bit earlier on, but at that point, you know, if they're not really in sync with the culture, you might see people leave at any, at any stage during that tenure. All right, so let's take a look at some graphs, and we're going to, you know, try to keep this from being too statsy. Um, but, you know, what's timing say? Um, and it really allows you to do a deeper dive into those events that drive turnover at different periods of time. Um, so in this graph, what you can see is that the percentage of turnover is highest around the two-week mark, two, two, one and a half to three-week mark, um, where you're seeing about 12% of that population that um, terms actually turning over. So, you know, what could be causing this? Well, remember my previous slide, it could be anything around the hiring or the onboarding. So, you know, was there something set unrealistic said about the job expectation? You know, in my experience with working with call centers, what we found is um, people who had never worked in a call center environment actually would tend to leave a lot faster because they had no idea that you had to like ask permission to use the restroom well, when that, they were waiting for calls. And that, but it makes such it makes complete sense, right? Because it's a completely new experience, kind of a shock to the system. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you had experience, so so with that customer, it's like, you know, not only does experience help that person mm -hmm. ramp up quicker because they know how to manage the multitasking and mm -hmm. the headsets and having to like say, hey, I need to use the restroom, put me on hold, or just the back to back calls they get. Um, so having experience help them with the expectation side, but also with the ability to be able to, you know, have experience and manage how to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So another kind of thing that you can look at, if, if you find that turnover is happening pretty heavily during training, um, you know, we've also seen some customers that have very strict attendance rules during a training period. And like, no, you know, you, if you miss one day, you are out. Um, so, you know, really kind of taking a look at that and how critical is that? Is there a way to kind of get around that? Because people do have emergencies um, during certain training. Um, the other, the other thing that's pretty interesting is if your time to hire is very long. So we found that if you pass like a, I think it's, I can't remember the stats exactly, but like a 40-day mark of how long it takes you to, to place a, someone in a role, you know, you're more likely to extend it out to like 60 and 90 days just because of that um, delay. And a lot of those applicants that you might have looked at have already gotten other jobs. Mm -hmm. So the longer your time to, to fill is, the more likely that candidate's been out there in that workforce, uh, in, the, in the market, and may have potential other offers. So we do tend to see from a reason perspective that people leave early because they got another job offer. And so that, I mean, that makes sense, Carol, in the sense that if that individual's been applying for jobs all along, some of those might come in post-hire. Yeah, absolutely. And then once you're in training and you get a taste of what it's all about, it may look more attractive yeah. depending on on what what the role is. And even like a 25 cent more a job, you know, 25 cents more per hour, um if you're not committed, if you're not locked in, if you really haven't built those relationships, it's easy to leave at that time mm -hmm. versus if you've already been there a while and really like it. Absolutely. Um, so skill sets uh, is also kind of a critical reason why people leave early on. They realize they can't do the job. Um, and then the poor job fit is the will they do the job, right? So is it something that they will enjoy and like? Um, so, you know, people who hate people don't tend to do well in hospitality-type roles. And that's where assessments can really help, um, you know, help you identify who's got a higher probability of success. Help you avoid people that hate people. That's right. <laughs> there was a turnover. I mean, a uh, Oprah uh, TV show on that at one time. I'm aging myself. Um, so it, another kind of interesting point, and this is um, really thinking about what does turnover cost at the various times of when people leave the business. So this is a survival um, chart, and, and survival analysis is something that really helps us understand what is the probability of somebody, um, you know, making it to that point in time um, and not turning over. So it's not that they're going to die, even though this this is used in in healthcare, um, but it is more of like, did the event happen? Did they turn over or not? Um, and so what you see here is you'll see some drops in terms of the line, and that's when big events of turnover are happening during certain points of time. Um, and you can look at it whether it's days or, or weeks to kind of get it a little bit more um, digestible. But what you find is, and, and I'll show you in the next slide here, if you start to think about productivity costs and training costs and some of these indirect costs of turnover, there comes a certain point through the, the tenure of that individual where you actually make a return on your investment if that person stayed up to that point. So in this situation, you know, it may be more like the 57-day mark or something to that effect. But the key things, um, why this is important is if you do have a role that's just not a great role, right? Like we know it's an entry-level job, you know, people have to do it. Um, and there's, you know, in your market, there's so many other jobs that pay similar and, and you know, you know they're going to have turnover. What can you do to, like, really extend the life of somebody working there so that you can at least hit your ROI point and actually get a little bit further down the road? So to calculate these things, we look at, you know, what's the hiring cost? What's a salary for that person times the number of days they're in training? What's your actual training cost? Um, you know, what's the... What's the average productivity once they're on the floor and they've had they've passed that ramp up period? Um, you know that can kind of help you give back in terms of cost. Like what are they bringing in terms of revenue back? Um, so these are things that we'll look at to really understand turnover and what it's truly costing the business at the different phases. So Carol, just let me recap. So is what you're saying that you know in some cases turnover itself is kind of inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so then what becomes important is really understanding what is that kind of minimum time period for retention yeah. in order for it to be profitable for the business to hire that individual. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's other things that you can do too and we'll we'll speak to that, but this is kind of in that, you know, in that chart like where I was actually adding up all the different pieces, these are the elements you want to think about. So, you know, there were higher higher costs, you know, what training costs. So here's an example, right? You have somebody that 
their recruitment and hiring cost was three grand. Um, them working, you know, ten days uh, to train that person cost, you know, let's say that they made um, if, for ten days of training, the event cost a thousand dollars per person. You got to then calculate how many days salary you paid for that person. So if they make one hundred twenty dollars a day, that's hundred, you know, twelve hundred bucks for that training period. The one thing that people don't pay attention to is the opportunity cost. And so if I can't operate my business at full profitability because right. I don't have bodies, mm -hmm. right, there is a cost to the business. And so that's where understanding um, how much does a vacancy of a person cost the business, a fully functioning person, that's where you get into the big numbers. Um, and really, like if you look at this example, if they left um, – under 10 days, you know, their turnover cost, including those vacancy costs, is going to be around $25,000. Wow. So it's a much bigger number. Um, but if, if you make it past, you know, day 56 for that person, they start to quickly start to get the return on investment and also make the business money. So it's absolutely a nice way to kind of be able to say, look, here as an HR professor, professional, here's the impact I'm having to the financial aspects of the business. And, you know, since I've saved you all this money, give me a bigger budget for something else, right? That's what we all want to do. <laughs> um, a couple more slides, and then we'll go back um, here in a second. But um, when where turnover is occurring is important. So if you do have a lot of different regions, you know, being able to kind of look at a heat map and understand where you see turnover um, happening. And then also when we talk about the turnover reasons, right? So, you know, do we see involuntary, voluntary turnover, and what are we finding out about it? You know, unfortunately, like in this example, um, you know, the job abandonment is probably one of the biggest buckets of why people leave. The more data you can get, like tying back your exit interview data into the actual stats here to be able to understand they left because they hated their boss or they left because of pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are important things that now can help you pinpoint a little bit more how to make improvements. Absolutely. And in, in, in our last poll, those were areas where we saw individuals on the on the call today actually looking at that data on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so I, I'm bringing this chart up again because I do think that there are things that you can do, um, you know, as a business to help improve your turnover costs. You know, one is, like, can you shorten the ramp up? Can you make it less expensive um, and still train people well uh, to do their job and get the resources they need? You know, can you reduce, um, you know, turnover just in terms of extending that past that break even? But also another element that you can do is if you hire better people, right? So if you're looking at higher quality folks, your productivity expectations can actually increase. Mm -hmm. So what they contribute to the job, because you've got a stronger performer, might not be $2,000 a day, but might be $3,000 a day. And that's where I think assessments really help, because if you really look for someone who has you know, a very close profile to someone who's extreme, to a group of people who are extremely successful, you kind of try to look for people that, that have that same either desire to do the job or also kind of innate natural tendencies that will help them um, be successful. All right, so let's do another poll. Um, so as you read these, you know, what we want you to do is pick as many that, that fit you, but, you know, which of these does your company do effectively? Um, so are they pretty good, and you can, you know, are they pretty good at determining the cause of turnover? Are they good at understanding the direct costs, like so what the, the higher training costs are? Are they pretty good at understanding the opportunity cost of turnover? So that would be C. Um, so, you know, what is that cost of a vacancy? When do they actually see productivity? Or are they good at implementing interventions to prevent turnover? E is other, and then F is you're not sure. So, Holly, can you take us to the polls there? Yeah, I'm expecting we're going to see some not sures here because sure. of the first <laughs> poll that we had. Um, but, yeah, so it looks like determining causes of turnover is a higher one here. Um, and, and I would also bet direct turnover, too. Oh, but it, it looks like several people are putting in the implementing interventions. So that's good. That's good. And I think the focus, you know, kind of across HR on engagement and um, creating some of that job involvement, job commitment, has has really made an impact on organizations. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, so Holly, let's go back to the presentation. It looks like this is still shifting. Oh, one thing is that the opportunity cost was pretty low there, so people aren't really paying attention to that as much. Great. So, I mean, so Carol, as a as a result of that poll, I mean, it, it sounds like there are some pretty direct recommendations around, you know, what individuals can be doing. So, when we think about identifying those causes, which it seemed like, um, you know, at least today's attendees felt at least reasonably confident in. Um, we look at what are those interventions and recommendations that we can make. So when we're doing this with an organization, we're looking at both um, from a new hire turnover perspective, are there kind of early turnover um, indicators? So to Carol's point, based on when the turnover is occurring and what the corresponding drivers might be, we'd make corresponding recommendations, right? So depending on those buckets. So for early turnover, for example, something might be implementing a realistic job profile, an RJP, um, so that we can create that continuity between what is communicated pre-hire and what an individual experiences post-hire. When we look at that longer term turnover, we might have things like really intervening with leaders in those regions of high turnover so that we're looking at their leadership style and elevating their game so we can increase potential commitment from the individuals working for them. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, one of the things I did want to just kind of mention here, too, in the presentation is, you know, as uh, if, if some of the folks on the call are really in, in talent acquisition, you know, one of the things that um, – the LinkedIn uh, recruitment kind of trends for 2017 said that there are three key metrics that they get measured against. You know, one is um, the length of time someone stays in a job. Well, that's turnover. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. Um, time to hire, which we did talk about because, you know, that can also have an impact on turnover if it takes so long. Not only do you kind of put a bad taste in that, that candidate's mouth about your culture, but also they might have other job opportunities pop in. And then the third one is, you know, the quality, the, hi the higher, uh, higher manager satisfaction. And that also, like your role as a talent acquisition person, um, being able to bring in better people, you can reduce that bleeding that you see in terms of your turnover costs because your productivity of the good ones can really be even at a higher average than what your typical um, hire has been in the past. So, um, you know, one of the things to think about in terms of time to hire and how you can utilize different components to really help you, um, you know, increase the efficiency that you have, you know, depending on what you put in place, you know, look at things that are detractors. You know, do you have a strong drop-off rate with your, your applicants in your application process? Um, are you seeing that when you go to interview, you know, you've got 15 people doing interviews with, you know, with one person or three people. What are the barriers that are being created? Um, just having a lack of technology. I mean, there's a ton of technology out there to help you sort and sift through applicants, um, be able to kind of put them in terms of who might have the higher probability of success um, with pre-screens. And, and also, you know, sometimes having to wait to fly in for an interview. Um, you know, video assessment tends to be a nice uh, way to kind of improve and speed up the process. And if anybody's doing reference checks, you know, definitely, um, you know, we see a great improvement in our customers in terms of how they scale their process and take a reference checking process that might take seven days down to about a day and a half. Um, so be able to get data on your final few candidates in terms of their references in a much more automated way. So looking at automation and how technology can really facilitate the process and then looking strategically um, as an analytics kind of, as, as a, a business partner allows you to, to identify those opportunities to streamline. Well, and when you have all those data points too, mm -hmm. like if you know, okay, I've got an assessment data point, I've got a reference data point, I've got an interview data point, I've got all these different pieces, that can also play a factor into the analytics as to what's really helping me avoid that turnover more mm -hmm. than other things helps you really kind of focus what you want to put your money into. Sure. Um, the other piece is, you know, when you look at just performance in the role, right, so sales performance and what's the impact of that. So here again, like being able to increase your overall mean and hire people who have a, a higher probability of being successful can really have not only great ROI for your business, um, but also can improve that amount of time, that, that point of optimal retention that we talked about. So the point as to where that, that hire is actually returning mm -hmm. um, revenue back to the business because they've been there long enough. 
And then once you once you solve that challenge, you can focus on increasing the revenue that they're bringing back to the business. Yep, absolutely. And then, you know, whatever your process is, right, so it's always important to kind of see where have I been, where am I going, right? And so taking a look at, you know, if I implemented in a particular location um, a, you know, a, a some kind of intervention, whether it's reference checking or it's an assessment or it's a certain kind of interview, behavioral interview, you know, what does it look like before and after? Um, a lot of times, though, in this market, before and after, like right now, it's pretty stable because unemployment is so low um, that, you know, your turnover is going to be higher than, than what you've probably seen in the past. So I wouldn't compare it to like last year or three years ago, but if you have a comparable group where you're able to kind of see, okay, did my intervention make a difference? Um, and to be able to kind of show show ROI in a slide similar to this where you say, look, here's what I was able to save the business because of this intervention that I put in place. Yeah, a time one, time two kind of analysis really gives you a better perspective. Yeah, definitely. Super. So great info, Carol. So we've covered a lot of ground um, today, but just as a quick recap, you know, from a recommendation standpoint, if we can minimize the push factors, leverage pull factors to the extent possible, Remember that that engagement will trump the little things about a role that might um, detract someone or be somewhat annoying. Keeping in mind that not all turnover is bad, and if you have very, very low turnover, you may want to look at the impact on your business as well. And that diagnostics from a qualitative standpoint are best paired with the data analysis analytics side, and they can together give you that what, why, and when of turnover. Um, and then keeping in mind your HR metrics. Are you tracking them? Are you, do you have mechanisms in place to monitor that data and then translate it into dollars and cents? Absolutely. So, Holly, we um, wanted to kind of open it up. I know you probably have gotten a couple questions come in. Um, do you want to facilitate a few questions coming through? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the wonderful presentation, both of you. Uh, we do have questions coming in, and it looks like we've got about four or five minutes, so maybe we'll get to a couple of them. And folks, as a reminder, if we don't get to your questions today, there will be a chance for Christina and Carol to follow up with you later on. So let's take our first question from Stephanie. So when turnover is evident to candidates, how do you address it in interviews by saying, we're working on it? Oh, so you mean um, I'm assuming applicants externally, um, where where they see that there's a lot of turnover happening? Is that, I'm assuming that's yeah. the question. I think so. Yeah, um, you know, I think that talking about the wonderful things about the organization. I mean, there's always going to be turnover. There's going to be change. I mean, the the first thing I would do is say, is that new hire turnover or is that overall turnover, right? And it's probably, I would expect, new hire turnover, especially if you look at Glassdoor and you see a lot of people putting reviews that they no longer work there. You know, all those things are going to play a factor that will detract, um, which will be a push, right, a push factor for those applicants. So I think it's really speaking to the pool factor, what the business stands for, um, and also, you know, really going deep and understanding what's causing it so that you can fix it and you can have specifics around the things that you are doing and implementing to, to fixing it. But, the, the you know, Stephanie is absolutely right. I mean, it's hard to hide nowadays. Um, you know, with Glassdoor and it being so much more transparent, your employment brand is at risk. Um, and, and so really making sure you treat your employees well uh, is critical. Yeah. Absolutely. The other thing I would add is ensuring that you're really connecting with that applicant around why they are a good fit, right? If, if, you're, if you're extending a hire or if there's someone you're really interested in, I think you want to you leverage the push factors, as Carol mentioned, beyond just making a list of this is what's great about here, but really making the connection to why it's a good fit for them personally, because that's where I think you really will will hook someone in, and uh, and especially if it's authentic, if you're if you're being honest with them. All right, thank you. We'll now take a question from Amira. So, how can you convince appropriate areas to conduct some of the diagnostic tools, especially if they are not convinced of the need to do so? That's a great question. Yeah. It 
that's that's part of you know having having yourself take a seat at the table with like the the decision makers and the leaders of the business and to be able to show you know a lot of times they might they might not even know what the cost of turnover is to them. Um, I think, you know, if if there's certain locations that are not as bought in as others, um, if you've got the data to back up that, no, you need it, you're like much higher than everybody else, and this is what it's costing the business, um, you know, it's first kind of working to get the, the buy-in more at the local level, but at some point getting kind of higher level buy-in from executives to say, you know, we need to do this five-minute new hire survey because it's helping us reduce turnover. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, you know, vendors that have case studies and things like that that can help put together the business case, um, but it's all about speaking in those business terms to be able to get things accomplished, I yeah. think. I've worked, with, I've worked with a number of clients, and where I've seen them able to create the biggest influence on operators and individuals in different regions is when they are prepared to talk dollars and cents. And so being armed with the data of how it's impacting the financials. Um, and then communicating that at all levels of the organization. So certainly, as Carol mentioned, when, when it's an executive um, priority, then it, it definitely creates a, a bit more movement for you. All right. Thank you so much. We have reached the bottom of the hour, so we'll go ahead and wrap up things for today. So one more big thank you to Outmatch, Carol, and Christina, as well as all of our listeners. We hope everyone has a yeah, great Holly afternoon. Yep. I was just going to say, if there are additional questions and you didn't get to them, just feel free to email or link in with Christina and I, and we'd be more than happy to reply directly, for sure. Of course. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.